So now we are going to welcome uh, Laurent Bapp uh, from Ecole Normale Supérieure. So uh, he's going, coming from France and is a specialist of the uh, ocean carbon cycle and climate modeling. Yeah. And um, we thought that it is so important to begin also the gift with a lecture about the, the climate. Um, maybe all all the day you you speak you chat with your neighbor with <laughs> about the climate. Sometimes uh, you are not very happy about the discussion, <laughs> but I think Laurent will help us um, to go ahead in this uh, topic, and I think is a very important topic in the classroom too. So please, the floor is yours, uh, Laurent. Good morning. Thank you for the invitation. It's great to be here, and it's great to talk to you about one of my favorite subjects. So I, I'm a climate scientist interested in the interactions between the ocean and climate. But today I will focus on marine ecosystems as part of this complex system. And we'll try to show you how marine ecosystems are affected by climate change. What are the potential feedbacks? And I will also briefly describe what is SDG 14. We already discussed it briefly, life below water. And I think I will demonstrate why it's important to conserve, restore life below water that is largely affected by, by climate change. Yes. Thank you. So sorry to start with this uh, complicated graph but it's a, it's a very special month to talk about the ocean. I guess maybe all of you have heard that ocean temperatures ju just reached the highest ever recorded temperatures, no? Uh, there were many articles in the general press over the past days. So April 2023 is the month where ocean temperatures at the surface between 60 south and 60 north uh, reached for the first time more than 21 degrees Celsius. So since the start of this monitoring, we've never seen such a warm ocean. So that, that's just another sign of uh, global warming, but for the ocean. And when you, oops, when you focus at the regional level, it's, so this is the map of uh, temperature anomalies as compared to you know, climatology, an annual mean over 1971, 2000. So you see that in many places, the ocean does show us very warm temperatures, all the red colors. So we have the highest ever surface ocean global temperature ever recorded with multiple marine heat waves. So it's a very, very special month to talk about the ocean. And why do we care? We care because the ocean is a key actor of the climate system. So with a very warm ocean, we will have extreme events, tropical cyclones and other kinds of events but we also care about what's in the ocean and especially marine ecosystems that are and will be affected by those very warm temperatures. And that's what I'd like to focus on in the next, in the next slide. So you all know that, yes, the ocean is home to a very rich biodiversity. And when you think marine ecosystems, that's the kind of pictures you have in mind, you know, coral reefs, whales and jellyfish and some nice microalgae on the right. But the ocean ecosystems are much more than just those iconic species. Uh, in fact, small organisms are very important in the ocean. And we know that for decades now, but we have more and more information about those very, very tiny organisms, phytoplankton and zooplankton. Uh, thanks to some new discoveries, the use of genes to monitor those, those organisms. You see that on the left with the Tara Ocean um, projects that describe many, many new organisms in the sea. And you see on the right where we find those tiny organisms, phytoplankton, within green regions where it's very productive and in blue regions where we don't find much. But those tiny organisms, they are responsible for most of the food webs in the ocean. So if we find those big and iconic species, it's because at the start of the food web, you have those very tiny organisms. So the marine biomass that we find in the ocean is in fact quite small. That's the tiny triangle, the blue triangle you have on the, on the top left. It's only 
six gigaton of carbon that we find in marine biomass. It's very tiny, very small as compared to the biomass you find on the continents. You know, almost 500 gigaton of carbon in the land biomass. So you would think, oh, it's very tiny. Why should we care so much about this very tiny biomass? Yes, some iconic species that we like to see when we dive, but is it important, this small biomass that you find in the ocean? Yes, it's important because despite being quite small, only a fraction of the total biomass you find on Earth, marine ecosystems, in fact, they account for half of global productivity. Uh, no, I have the control. Yes, thank you very much. So you see on the right uh, where productivity occurs. So of course, in the big tropical forests, as you all know, but also in the ocean in some specific regions at high and mid latitudes in the northern hemisphere, also close to the coast and in the southern ocean, you see high regions with lots of marine productivity. So yes, half of the oxygen is produced in the ocean, half of the organic matter is produced every year in the ocean. Uh, but because of that, marine ecosystems, they play a very important role in the global carbon cycle. Why? Because phytoplankton produce organic matter at the ocean surface, and then part of this organic matter sinks down in the water column to the deep ocean. And when it sinks down in the water column to the deep ocean, basically it's, it sequesters carbon away from the atmosphere. So that's what you have on the bottom left here. That's what we call the biological carbon pump. And it's a very important process in the natural ocean carbon cycle because it explains most of the vertical gradient of carbon in the ocean, thanks to life, thanks to marine ecosystems. And so we have lots of questions about the potential stability of this biological carbon pump in face of climate change. Will phytoplankton still carry and transport carbon to the deep ocean or will it feed back on the, on the global carbon cycle and then on climate change? The other big reason why we care about marine, marine ecosystems is here. Uh, it's what we call a provisioning marine ecosystem service. It's the fact that we get lots of our proteins from the sea. Uh, we fish 80 million tons per year. Uh, this is you know, a huge economic sector, $400 billion. And so if marine ecosystems are, are, if marine ecosystems are affected by climate change, this will you know, affect also fisheries fishing uh, and, and our economies. And last but not least, sorry again, last but not least, uh, the tourism sector is also in many, many countries relying on marine ecosystems, especially coral reefs. That's an example from the Great Barrier Reef in Australia. You see that's almost 2 million visitors per year, more than 50,000 jobs, and more than $5 billion per year, Australian dollar per year are relying on those healthy coral reefs. So that's a very quick picture about marine ecosystems and why we should care about marine ecosystems, you know, not only for the climate and the biological carbon pump, but for many other ecosystem services that are here uh, quickly described. And so this is something clear for decades now, and it's somehow at the base of this SDG 14, Life Below Water, which aims at conserving and sustainably using the oceans, seas, and marine resources. And you see here a short description of this SDG 14. And in addition to this SDG 14, you may know that the United Nations, they've declared a decade of ocean science for sustainable development. So along all the political discussions, treaties, agreements, we also need to develop science for a better use, a better conservation of the ocean. And what I will try to do now is to show you what we know with the science we've developed over the past years in terms of marine ecosystems and how they're affected by climate change. So this is my lecture today. What are the impacts of climate change on the ocean and its ecosystems? And I will also briefly mention at the end some of the other threats to marine ecosystems because somehow addressing those threats would increase the resilience of marine ecosystems and hence protect those ecosystems from uh, climate change. So in brief, the message of my first part here is that, as you know, climate change is altering the physical, chemical properties of the ocean. And hence, those physical and chemical modifications, they affect 
the distribution and functioning of ecosystems. And I will also show you a few of these projections that we produce. Uh, and I will show that depending on the different scenarios for the 21st century, even more significant changes are expected. I won't leave you just with this. And I will try to also discuss briefly solutions at the end of my presentation. Yes. So as you've seen in my first slides, the ocean surface has warmed by quite a lot, almost one degree since 1850. So this is a, a graphic from the last IPCC report. You see that, yes, the ocean at the surface, they warm not as quick as over the continents because of their large inertia, but they warm also. They warm at the surface, but they warm also at depths. And this increasing temperature, they will affect the distribution of marine species. And I will show that in a, in a second. Yes, another big uh, effect of this warming in the ocean, plus the addition of water from melting ice on the continents is the fact that sea level is rising. This is again a graphic from the last IPCC report. You see that sea level has risen by 20 centimeters since 1900 and it's accelerating. So when I was a student, the numbers we were taught was 2.5, 2 millimeter per year. Now it's almost four millimeter per year. So it's not only 20 centimeters, it's the fact that it's accelerating because warming is accelerating and because melting, especially of glaciers and ice, sh ice uh, shelves is, is accelerating too. Third, the Arctic Ocean is a place where warming is, is very large, three, four times uh, what we see at the global scale. And in response to this warming, uh, you know that sea ice is retreating in the Arctic. Uh, you see here also graphics from the last IPCC report on the left. We've lost almost half of the surface of sea ice in summer in the Arctic. So you can imagine the implications for ecosystems there, relying partly on sea ice for their, uh, for their survival. So this is about quickly about physics of the ocean, warming, sea ice, sea level rise, but Chemistry is also changing. Uh, I guess most of you have heard about ocean acidification. Uh, the ocean surface is becoming more acidic or more acidified because of the uptake of anthropogenic carbon in the ocean. And what you see here on the right, again, a graphic from the last IPCC report is that the ocean surface has lost 0.1 pH units since 1900, and so this is a huge modification of uh, the ocean chemistry. And uh, the principle is, is quite simple. You know, CO2, when it dissolves, uh, is a weak acid, carbonic acid, and so it produces H+. It also consumes carbonate ion. You see the last equation on, on, the, on the right. Uh, and so this dissolution causes acidification. It's mostly a threat for calcifying organisms because they rely on the use of carbonate ions to produce their shells, their skeletons, and their tests. And so with ocean acidification, you have less and less carbonate ion in water. And so it's more and more difficult to calcify. Uh, and so when you think about calcifying organisms, this is a nice portfolio of some of these. You have, of course, corals in the middle, but also bivalves, some cold water corals that you may know not as well. Uh, phytoplankton, calcifying phytoplankton as coccolithophrates on the top right, but also some tiny and small zooplankton pteropods on the bottom right that are among the species more threatened by ocean acidification. So acidification is not the only modification of ocean chemistry. The other one is ocean deoxygenation. Uh, so because of warming, uh, because of modifications of the physics of the ocean, the ocean is losing oxygen. And this is a map on the right where you see the ocean losing oxygen. And the consensus is that the ocean has lost approximately 2% of its oxygen since the pre-industrial. And this is a threat for many organisms that rely on respiration, of course, and on oxygen in seawater for their survival. So the principle is quite simple here for deoxygenation. You know that O2 and the other gases, they are much less soluble when uh, warming increases. So you have less atmospheric O2 that dissolves at the surface. And in addition to that, 
in addition to the warming effects, uh, we monitor a more, a more and more stratified ocean. So because the ocean warms at the surface, the density is less and less. And so you have less mixing with the subsurface ocean. So a more stratified ocean. And so this prevents oxygen to penetrate in deeper waters. And so it's mostly in the subsurface where this effect takes place. And so that's mostly where organisms are threatened by this deoxygenation. Uh, and you have here some uh, example of potential impacts uh, with the median lethal oxygen concentration for a few taxa, crustacea, fish, bivalve, gastropods, and in fact, below a few tens of micromol per liter, those organisms would not be able to survive in the ocean. And naturally, we have already uh, places, regions that are very poor in oxygen. Uh, but with global warming, we expect those regions to expand. And so we expect those inhabitable regions for many of these organisms to expand with, with climate change. So a few words about ecosystems. It's much more you know, difficult to give big numbers uh, because it's much more difficult to observe. It's much more difficult to monitor than when you talk about sea surface temperature or when you talk about pH, because we have you know, common ways to describe uh, chemistry and physics of the ocean. Uh, also, when describing ecosystems changes over the past decades, uh, we lack long time series. And so because those distribution and functioning are very variable, it's difficult to infer those changes over long time uh, scales. Uh, so here is a, is a kind of a symbolic example because we have, thanks to our UK colleague, a very long time series of observing zooplankton in the Northeast Atlantic. You know, from the 50s, they've been using the same method to get water samples and to look at those water samples describing the different species of zooplankton. And what they show is, is a clear movement, northward migration of those species. So that's one example from some warm water temperate copepods, so those small crustaceans that you see at the bottom left, and they move to the north because they follow their thermal niche. And so that's a clear example of how global warming here, local warming is affecting the distribution of a given population. And so this is one example, but we have more and more of these examples. In the last IPCC report, out of 12,000 marine species that have been documented and monitored, more than half move poleward. So towards the north in the northern hemisphere, towards the south in the southern hemisphere. So they follow basically their thermal niche. So one way to describe this movement is to use what we call climate velocities. So that's a map of climate velocities. So climate velocities, it's the speed at which you would, you would have to move if you would like to stay, or if you, as a marine organism, would like to stay in waters of the same temperature. And so this is what we can compute over the last decades. Uh, you have the movements towards the pole, of course, and you see that you would have to move 50 kilometers per decade at the surface if, as a marine organism, you would, would like to stay in the same thermal niche. And even when you go deeper in the water column, you would still have to move. And for many of these organisms, it's just not possible, especially for the Cecil organisms, reefs, coral reefs, but also sponges and many other organisms, they're fixed at the bottom. And so they just don't move. Uh, and so this climate velocities is used a lot by uh, ecologues to document the movements of marine population towards the pole. So this is the response to the mean warming. We have also more and more examples of how marine ecosystems respond to extreme events and especially to marine heat waves. So this is an example of an, uh, an coral reefs. And you see again from uh, one of the last IPCC report, the fact that we know now uh, that warming has increased, of course, the frequency of large scale coral, coral bleaching events leading to reef degradation worldwide since 1997-98. Uh, uh, and that's on the map an example of the global extent of mass coral bleaching in 2015-2016. So that was the large big El Nino event that caused lots of uh, coral bleaching events, especially in the Western Pacific and in the Indian Ocean. 
And you see on the time series on the bottom uh, right, the number of bleaching events that has increased quite a lot. Maybe just a word about today's situation. I've talked about uh, those warming level in April 2023. Uh, we have some predictions that tell us that we may expect a new El Nino event at the end of the year. So it's not yet sure, but if it's the case, we have to expect some new bleaching event, especially in the, in the Western Pacific and in the Indian Ocean. Okay, and that's again a graph from the last IPCC report um, showing some examples of those marine heat waves and how they've perturbed, how they've affected marine ecosystems. And you see many examples from the Med Sea in 2003, how it affected marine ecosystems. Uh, you see those, those events uh, linked to El Nino, mostly around uh, uh, Australia here, and this big one that you may have heard about, you know, the Pacific blobber that lasted two years with very high temperatures and that has affected marine ecosystems, but also ecosystem services. So fisheries were affected, aquaculture was affected, et cetera, et cetera. So that's another way uh, climate change is altering marine ecosystems through those extreme events, in addition to just this gradual warming in the ocean. So let me give you now a few maybe hints about how we simulate, how we project the evolution of marine ecosystems in the coming decades, and what are the differences between the different CO2 emission scenarios that we have for the coming decades. So what you may not know is the fact that in those big climate models that we use to do climate projections, we've embedded, we've included some simple description of marine ecosystems. Why did we do that? At start, to represent the carbon cycle. Because when you simulate the climate system, you need to simulate also, you know, the ocean carbon sink and the land carbon sink. And to do so, you have to include a representation of plankton. And now we are able to use those models to tell us something about marine phytoplankton. And this is what I will describe now. So you have here the two ingredients you need to do those climate projections. Top right, a climate model. And bottom left, some scenarios in terms of CO2 emissions. So usually we use you know, a series, a portfolio of scenarios from high mitigation, the blue one here to high emission scenarios. And the high mitigation scenarios, and I will tell you that in a second, is the only one that leaves us below these two degree targets that we've talked about already. Um, so what do we do with those scenarios and models? First, we simulate the environment and how it responds to those different scenarios. So here you have on the right, the high emission scenario, on the left, the high mitigation scenario, and you have two of these important variables for ecosystems, sea surface temperature and acidification. And you have, you know, the scenario from 2005 to 2100. And what you see here is that despite the fact that those two scenarios in terms of emissions, they divert very quickly, in terms of the environment, it stays the same almost till 2050. It's only in the second part of the century that we have a huge divergence between those two scenarios. And yes, at the end of the century, it's two different worlds uh, for the ocean. Uh, of course, much more acidified, much warmer in the high emission scenario, and much less warm, much less acidified in the high mitigation scenario. So, if we manage to limit CO2 emissions, to decrease CO2 emissions and to reach net zero, we'll also manage to limit ocean warming. That's very intuitive, but also to limit ocean acidification. And so this is the kind of graphs that you've seen a lot. Uh, global temperature on the upper right and global ocean surface pH on the bottom right. And you see that depending on the scenarios, we'll have a different ocean in the coming decades. So what can we tell about ocean ecosystems depending on those scenarios? Let me come back to phytoplankton, uh, which is the key element of marine food webs because it's the first trophic uh, level. Um, and what maybe you know, most of you, is that phytoplankton in the sea, they are limited mostly by two factors, light. That's why we find them at the surface of the ocean, but also nutrient availability. So they need nutrient to grow. And in the ocean, nutrients are concentrated in the deep ocean. In fact, because of this biological carbon pump. 
And so to grow phytoplankton, they need light at the surface, but they need also nutrient supply from below with you know, mixing in the ocean, vertical currents bringing nutrients to the surface. So phytoplankton growth is controlled by nutrient abundance and light mostly. And with climate warming, what we see and what we expect for the coming decades, it's a more and more stratified ocean. So that means less nutrient supply from below. If you have a more stratified ocean, you have less mixing. And so you have less nutrient supply from below. So we expect a decrease of phytoplankton productivity in the coming decades because of this very simple process. And that's exactly what the models confirm for the next decades. And here, what we've done in the last IPCC report is not only projecting phytoplankton productivity, but linking these projections to fish ecosystem models uh, and here to uh, fish catch potential for fisheries. And you see in red for the high emission scenario here that in many places, in many regions, we expect for the end of the century, a large decrease of fish catch potential. And that's linked to phytoplankton productivity. The fact that we simulate a more stratified ocean, less nutrient supply, less phytoplankton productivity, less transfer to upper trophic levels, less fish and less fish catch potential. So that's another key risk in terms of how climate change may affect marine ecosystems. What you see here also is that at higher latitudes, especially in the Arctic, you have blue colors. That means that we could expect more fish because of the migration of fish species, because also of the sea ice that would melt, more light, more phytoplankton productivity. So we'll have differences, but at the global scale, we have to expect uh, less biomass in the ocean and, and so on, less fish catch potential. Last word on, on coral reefs. Uh, you have basically a double factor, double effects, both temperature that leads to bleaching, top right, but also pH and acidification that will uh, make life of course more complicated in the coming decades. And what uh, the IPCC says in the last uh, report is that at two degrees, basically, um, and even if global warming remains below two degrees, nearly all coral reefs will degrade from their current states. Uh, and so we'll have very different coral reefs in the, in, the coming, in the coming decades, even if we stay below two degrees. And acidification will drive uh, mostly poor habitats for coral reefs almost everywhere on the planet in the coming decades. So that's one of the key ecosystems that is endangered because of both climate change and, and ocean acidification. Maybe before I finish, before I conclude, before I talk about solutions, and I also want to say a few words about resources for teachers. Uh, but in addition to climate change, ocean warming, and ocean acidification, you have other threats uh, that may affect marine ecosystems in the coming decades that are already affecting marine ecosystems. Very quickly, what we call eutrophication in the coastal zones, you know, the addition of nutrients coming from land that increase productivity in the coastal zone and that lead to hypoxic zones, to the consumption of oxygen, what we call dead zones. Uh, overfishing, of course, and pollution of many types. So just a few words on, on fishing. Uh, in in uh, orange here, you see the amount of fish we get from the sea, wild fish. So you see it has stabilized to 80 uh, million tons uh, since the 90s. Yeah. It's not because we fish less. It's because of the overexploitation and the collapse of many fish stocks. And so we rely more and more on, on aquaculture now but you also know that to feed aquaculture, we use smaller and smaller fish from the sea. So in many cases, it's not a, a good solution. Uh, and as you see, uh, some uh, stocks have collapsed. And the, the key example is the one from the Northwest Atlantic and the cod uh, that has collapsed as early as in the 70s. A quick word about uh, the plastic ocean, the concentrations of small plastic debris in the middle of the oceans that also a key example to describe to your students because it somehow enlights how ocean circulation moves those particles in the ocean and concentrates those particles in the ocean. So you can both teach how the ocean circulation works and discuss the potential impacts of ocean plastic pollution on marine ecosystems. Uh, that's an example with a, a sperm whale and how much plastic you can find 
in the stomach, uh, stomach of a, a sperm whale. And my last example is about eutrophication and, and those uh, green tides or brown tides in many places. Um, yes, rather dark panorama, I agree. Um, but you see that in addition to this pan panorama, if you go to the IPCC report, you would find a huge portfolio of solutions. So it's not that we don't know the solutions. In fact, for many of these, we just know the solution. It's barriers, difficulties, political will that uh, doesn't help us uh, to go further. But with the Paris Climate Conference agreement targets, keeping warming well below two degrees, of course, that would improve the situation for marine ecosystems. And we need to do everything we can uh, to keep warming, if possible, at 1.5, but well below two degrees. We have many other solutions at the local or regional scale. Uh, local solutions, regulations, fishing quotas, creation of marine protected areas, et cetera, et cetera. So the ocean, the ocean is also part of the solution somehow. It's affected. It's a climate actor. It's affected, but it's also part of the solution. OK, I'd like to finish with a few educational resources. Many of what I've showed, you would find that online, of course. So maybe you will get the PDF. You will have everything. But there are much more on, uh, on internet. Maybe some of you know the Office for Climate Education. Uh, they've just published a few years ago, I think two years ago, uh, this first Climate in Our Hands uh, volume, which is on the ocean and the cryosphere. So you would find a summary of what I just discussed, but you would also find many examples of practicals to do in class. You know, how do you show to students, what's ocean acidification? You know, you use shells and you show how it dissolves when you decrease pH. So lots of examples on the Ocean for Climate Education uh, website. Second edu educational resource, that's just one of the examples to show your students how we observe the ocean. Uh, it's called the Adopt a Float Program. Maybe some of you know it. Uh, yes. So the idea is, is quite interesting to follow ocean temperature. You know, we have this... Uh, this program uh, with 4,000 floats drifting in the ocean. And so if you uh, use this program, you would be able with your class to adopt one of these floats and to follow it in the ocean. So great uh, use of this program to teach about ocean circulation, to teach about ocean ecosystems, et cetera, et cetera. And then a few more. Maybe you know the Mercator Ocean International. They have, they've also just released a new tools to learn about the ocean and to look at the ocean state. So it's a, it's a software visualization tool that you can play with to show temperature, to show chlorophyll, to show many other variables in the ocean. You can zoom in some regions, move over the last years. So it's also a great tool to discover the ocean. And the last one uh, is the IPCC interactive atlas you know i've showed some projections just go on this website you can create your own projections with this ipcc interactive atlas focus on a given scenario focus on a given variable and show your students how they can use output from climate models to document potential futures for our world so lots of resources on the web and not so difficult to use so i urge you to use them as much as possible Okay, that's all for me. Thank you very much.